from Seattle is John Perkins. He served as chief economist at a major international consulting firm and is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John, thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you, Anand. Thank you. Does the creation of this bank by the Chinese pose a major challenge to U.S. global economic interests? It, it certainly does, yes. And, and perhaps even more importantly is it really opens the door uh, for some of the countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, all, all over the world. You know, it's primarily oriented toward Asia. But at the same time, we've got the BRICS Bank, and there's a lot happening that China's taking a huge lead on challenging the what was what was once the, the 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 total power financial power of the United States and and Europe, so something very significant is happening here. So at the moment we have the World Bank, we have the International Monetary Fund, both of those organizations which are headquartered right here in Washington D.C. How does the United States use those organizations to further its <laughs> own economic interests around the world? I think it's. I think it's safe to say that since the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, those banks, as well as the Asian Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and a number of other such organizations, have been used to further uh, corporate interests. And these are primarily U.S. corporations, although they, they're really multinational now, but very much supported by the United States, by the World Bank, by the IMF, by the Pentagon and the CIA. We've really got a, a, a world... Uh, a global empire today, and it's not, a, not an American empire, it's a corporate empire, but the United States has been very much behind it, and I think China today is challenging that. Now, you wrote that book, as I mentioned, uh, the bestseller, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. What exactly is an economic hitman? Well, I, I, I think, you know, we did many different things, but perhaps the most generic thing that we did was to identify countries that have resources our corporations covet, and that, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan uh, for that company, uh, for that excuse me, for that country through the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money didn't actually go to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, things like power plants and industrial parks. They benefit a few wealthy people, but not the majority of the citizens who don't have enough money to buy much electricity can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people, and yet the country is left holding a huge debt that it can't repay. So at some point we go back and say, okay, since you can't pay your debts, sell your oil or whatever the resource is real cheap to our corporations, and privatize your electric utilities, your water and sewage systems, sell them to our corporations too. It, it was really this approach that has created this global empire that's a corporate empire, and today it's, it's truly being challenged by, by China and uh, some of the other nations that are siding with China in this process. I think it's a very healthy thing, incidentally, this challenge that's happening. Now, you spent part of your career selling these uh, energy projects, these hydroelectric facilities, infrastructure projects to underdeveloped countries. Uh, take us through you know, how something like that could be used for the benefit of the United States. Well, in essence, uh, th this, is, this is a metaphor. I didn't, uh, didn't really do it quite like this, but, but, but the metaphor is that I would walk into the president of a country's office or, or the minister of finance or somebody high in, high in a high position and say, hey, you know, listen, in this pocket I've got a few hundred million dollars for you and your friends and cronies. If you sign these contracts and build these projects, your folks are going to get very wealthy. You own the industries. You own the shopping malls. You're going to benefit from this electricity, and we're going to hire your brother's uh, firm to, 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 to dig the ditches. You know, he has a little construction company, and your, and your, and your sister-in-law who, who owns the John Deere franchise, she's going to make a lot of money off this. Uh, and so if you sign this deal, you're going to get a lot of bennies. Of course, the money is not actually going to ever come to your country. It's going to go directly to one of our big corporations to build these projects. Uh, and if you don't sign the contract, in this pocket over here, I got a gun. I didn't actually carry a gun. I never did anything illegal. But that president, as well as I, knew very well that the CIA or somebody that's got a gun is right behind me. And, and you know, they'd seen presidents taken down in like Allende in Chile and Arbenz and in, 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 in Guatemala, Mossadegh in Iran, and, and on and on. The list is, is extensive. Right. You know, in the post-Cold War, we, of course, have a, a unipolar world with one superpower. <laughs> but now we have China trying to develop its bank. We have other things happening. Uh, Russia is exerting its influence. So is Venezuela. So is Iran. More recently, Greece. Is it a case of these countries saying, well, we don't like the status quo right now. We're going to push back? 
Absolutely. And I think it's, it's also a fact that the United States and our corporations really blew it. When the Soviet Union ended, uh, we had an opportunity to use the World Bank and all these other organizations and, 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 and corporations to, to, to create a better world, to really do a good job. Instead, they tended to go out and exploit people. They became very greedy. They followed the, a new economic model, which was defined by Milton Friedman in the 1970s, that what I call predatory capitalism, that basically said the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. That was different somewhat from Keynesian economics, which had gone before it. That model has created a disaster. We all know this. You know, the glaciers are melting, the oceans are rising, species are going extinct. We're creating a very, very dangerous world for ourselves. And, and so, the, really, the United States and our corporations and our European allies blew it. And most of the world sees this. I travel a lot in Latin America and, 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 and the Middle East and Asia and, and all over. And, and people really understand this. So China now is coming along and offering an alternative. And hopefully China has learned from the U.S. mistakes. And, and I think in this case, competition can be healthy. Perhaps the United States and our corporations will under, begin to understand that they have to do a different job. They have to approach the world differently. So I, I think this can be a healthy thing. Of course, it could also go the other way. And, and, and China could, could follow in the American example and not do a good job either. But let's hope for the best here. But something is changing. I mean, if we look at uh, you know, the United States putting pressure on its allies not to join this bank, those allies are basically ignoring what the United States is saying. We've got the United Kingdom, one of the closest allies of the United States. We have Italy, Germany, France, four big economies in the European Union who are now saying they will join. Yes, I think they're, 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 they're understanding that we're in a changing world. Uh, and it, it, the leadership in the United States either doesn't get it, which I, which I don't believe, but doesn't want to get it, doesn't know what to do. So Obama and all the leaders in the United States, including, including corporate leaders, are caught in a very difficult bind uh, because of the mentality that's been created uh, in the United States and, and among uh, corporate stockholders and so forth. Uh, it's basically very, very aggressive. You know, and, and uh, so the United States and our corporations is reacting by saying, no, no, we can't go that route. Uh, I think that's a big mistake, but I understand why it's happening. It's because of the, the politics of, of aggression that we've, that we've formed. But, you know, we've really been telling ourselves a story of separation. And what we need to start telling ourselves is a story of inclusion, that we all live on a very fragile planet, a very fragile space station that doesn't have any shuttles to escape from. And, and we've got to work together. But we don't see that yet amongst our leaders.